In 2001, there were 341 homicides in the Philadelphia metropolitan area. This is the story of one of those cases. Officer down. All you shots fired. Officer down. We got a report of an officer down. That's when I saw Mike. Mike had a reputation as a good cop. I trusted Mike with my life, and he trusted me with his. His eyes was open. He had a look on his face like, oh my god. His hands was up in the air like this. Some of us were trying to work on him. I've been involved in other instances where police officers have been shot and killed, but I've never been involved in an incident where the police officer was assassinated. I had a pit in my stomach. That was like the worst day of my life. When your brother's not there to see his daughter graduate from college, he's not there to see his grandkids being born. There's still a hole in all of our hearts for Mike. I'm saying to myself, I'll find that evidence. I will solve this case. Michael Beverly will not have died in vain, and we will not let his killer go. We will find. Mike Beverly grows up in Chester, Pennsylvania, a fading industrial city on the outskirts of Philadelphia. Mike is my baby brother. It was 13 of us. We grew up very close, knitted family. It was all kinds of regular fun, making lemonade stands, playing baseball on the corner. You had some, you know, issues, but nothing like what you deal with today. After a stint in the Marines, Mike attends Northeast Christian University. And that's where he met Claudia. I would say he came home when he wanted to marry Claudia. They were totally in love, and they got married, had five kids, beautiful kids. Mike absolutely loved being a dad. He really did. In 1989, at the age of 24, Mike joins the Chester Police Force. The city of Chester is a uh pretty rampant with dealing of cocaine and trafficking of drugs during that period of time. Known for shootings and guns and homicides. I thought, you know, we need some good police officers on the force that know people in the city. We grew up in the city, so I figured he might could do some good for it. Mike was an excellent police officer. He knew the ins and outs of the streets. The Chester Police Department had a detective division, and Mike was assigned to that division. Mike was an outstanding detective, an outstanding police officer. The attention to detail that he paid, uh, his source information, his ability to gather information within the city were second to none. In 2000, Mike is promoted to corporal. Mike was an integral part of uh, training officers when they first came on to teach them how to do it the right way. Mike taught us how safety was first, always safety first. And he said, you always want to come home. Being young, uh, rookie police officer, I always said, I would like to pattern myself after him. The number one task for Mike and his team is to keep Chester Street safe from the Boyle Street Boys, a gang that rules the Highland Gardens neighborhood. Highland Gardens is on the west side of the city of Chester. At that time, it was a poor neighborhood, a lot of abandoned houses, a lot of run-down houses. High crime was there. It was so bad that the city lights, the street lights were out. Highland Gardens uh, at that time was an open-air uh, drug market. It was a very violent area. There was gunshots all the time. The individuals that lived in there were people that carried guns. The Boyle Street Boys had a special reputation for violence. Mike knew who they were. He knew them very well. He actually said, Ray, if you ever go up into Highland Gardens, 
Don't go up by yourself and don't go up at night. On October 16, 2001, at 4 p.m., Mike starts roll call at the Chester Police Department. That's where we get our assignments and our updates by our supervisor. They are on the hunt for Brian Rogers, a member of the Boyle Street Boys. A week earlier, he allegedly shot a young mother named Tracy Saunders. She'd agreed to be a witness in the case against the gang. In uh, the summer of 2001, Tracy Saunders purchased two weapons for her cousin and another member of the Boyle Street Boys. And she had uh, purchased the guns, what they call a straw purchase. The Boyle Street Boys, they were stopped by Chester police officers, and in their possession were the same guns that Tracy purchased for them. When they ran the serial numbers, those guns came back to Tracy. Making a straw purchase for someone that should not have a gun, you can be arrested and sent to jail. It is a federal crime. They're telling me that if I don't testify in the grand jury, I'm gonna go to jail. She says, I have two kids. I can't go to jail. She agreed. The mistake that Tracy made is Tracy told her cousin that the authorities wanted her to testify. The members of the Boyle Street crew, the gang, knew that they were going to get everything from her, and they couldn't let that happen. And that's when the decision was made to kill her. On the 8th of October was a Sunday night. Tracy Saunders was coming out. She worked the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift at a uh, drugstore. Brian Rogers walked straight up to the vehicle. The window was down. He fired one round into the side of her head. He then reached into the car and fired a second round into her head, making sure she was dead. I said to Mike, what do you know? He goes, Ray, it's these Boyle Street guys. He says, they're bad. He said, they just killed this poor woman who has two babies. He says, they are there's nobody that's better in this whole city than them. And he said this to me, and I never told you this before, but he said this to me, he says, if anything ever happens to me, Ray, these are the guys that are gonna do it. It's just what he said to me. The lines were crossed uh, when you shot and killed and executed a young mother who was standing up to do the right thing. Outraged by the senseless murder of this young mother, Mike is determined to track down Brian Rogers. Mike would say there's no reason why she was just gunned down like a dog. It was just a shame when people trying to do something right and there is no respect for human life, no human decency. Although he tells the officers they should be on the lookout for Brian, he warns them not to go to Highland Gardens. There were three detectives that were uh, working undercover operations up at that location. He stressed to us, stay out of the gardens. He said that multiple times, stay out the Highland Gardens. And when he walked out, we kind of looked at each other and we laughed. It was a little inside joke. How many times is he going to tell us, stay out the gardens? <laughs> that day, it was quiet, a little more quiet than normal. But you couldn't put your hand on where the tension was coming from. Around 9.30, my partner and I receive a radio call with a tone to it. Officer down. All you shots fired. Officer down. And the call said, we got a report of an officer down. All units report to Warden 10. And they gave the location in the Highland Gardens. At the time, we looked at each other because this has to be a bad call. Despite Mike's directive that night not to go to Highland Gardens, his men can't ignore this call. We rush into our cars. I look at my colleague and I said, 
be careful, all right? We gotta get out here, we gotta be careful. We were the second car that arrived on location, and it's a big crowd there. We're out, weapons drawn for officer safety. As everybody is moving, getting out the way, that's when I saw Mike. From experience, we know when somebody is deceased. But because that was one of our own, we didn't want to accept it. Mike Beverly's team has responded to a call of an officer down in Highland Gardens. Everyone is stunned to discover it's him. I was upset uh, uh, that it was Mike. <laughs> we had spent a lot of time together and uh, uh, been through a lot of things. But I knew that uh, uh, I needed to keep my composure that evening if this was going to get solved. Do the right thing. Make sure you do it properly. Detectives quickly locked down the crime scene and attempt to get a better picture of the injuries Mike sustained. Michael Beverly was shot four times, twice in the head and twice in the torso, in between the opening of his vest. The shooter was at a very close range when he... The question looming in everyone's mind is why Mike had ventured into Highland Gardens after warning his squad to stay away from there. I had no clue what was going on, no clue of why he was there, no clue of anything. Things are going through my mind, such as, why didn't he call out? Why is Mike here? For Mike to be in that neighborhood, tell us not to go into it, we thought that he had some knowledge, maybe. Somebody contacted him. Detectives wonder if Mike got a tip about Brian Rogers, the gang member suspected in the murder of Tracy Saunders. Could Mike have decided to follow a lead on his own? Mike was very anxious for Brian to be taken into custody. He took the Tracy Saunders murder very hard. And I do believe in my soul that Mike wanted Brian back to bring justice for Tracy and for her family. Now they can't help but wonder if Brian Rogers killed Mike. We thought that Mike was set up. We believed that he was shot and killed by Brian Rogers. If the Boyle Street boys decided that Michael Beverly should be killed, then Brian Rogers would have no problem killing Michael Beverly. News of the fallen officer spreads quickly. Tonight, police are on the hunt for a suspect in the brutal murder of one of their own. There's a news flash comes over the TV, breaking news. Police officer uh, killed in, in Chester. And I'm like, oh my God. I made a call and I found out it was Mike Beverly. I had a pit in my stomach. Uh, it just, uh, I couldn't believe like that. Everybody was just broken hearted. Detectives continue to believe Brian Rogers is their guy. But they're going to have to find a way to prove it. After the uh, um, death of Mike Beverly, detectives did intensify their effort to find Brian Rogers. I mean, you had a guy that was a member of the Boyle Street Boys, and then you had an officer now who was dead. So it was a serious effort to go get Brian Rogers. I thought there had to be somebody that saw this take place. They return to Highland Gardens to canvas for witnesses. We were going to stop everybody that came and went and a question and write down everybody's name that we could possibly talk to. I start talking to some of the people in the neighborhood. Nobody will talk to us. They said, if I say something to you, 
I might not be here tomorrow. Snitching back in that time, you know, the, the old saying was, you know, sn snitches get stitches, but up in the Boyle Street area, you know, you snitch, you die. And I'd have grandmothers telling their grandchildren, you don't talk to anybody, you don't say anything to the police, you keep your mouth shut. People weren't speaking to police, people were afraid. There's a lot of uh, family ties there in that community. Chester is small. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody's related to everybody. So a lot of fear came with that as well. We're investigating a murder case. Wall Street Gang, they had an iron fist in that city. The investigation was hot and heavy. Posters were made, they were placed in businesses, flyers was given out. People, not only detectives, were out there pounding pavement, trying to get someone to speak on it. And it seemed like we were going nowhere. But Brian Rogers can't stay hidden for long. Brian Rogers was arrested in Darby, Pennsylvania by Darby Borough Police Department. He was with another member of the Boyle Street Gang at a girlfriend's house. Once in custody, investigators hope Brian Rogers will confess to the murders of Mike Beverly and Tracy Saunders. But he refuses to talk. He immediately lawyered up and asked for an attorney. That's when Detective Carr gives Rogers an ominous warning. I told him, I know what you've done. I know who you did it to. You need to make sure that you take care of yourself because one of your guys are going to flip. So do you want to get on the bus first or do you want to get on last? He kind of looked at me and uh, didn't say anything. And I said, thanks for listening, Brian. And he says, we'll be talking again, guaranteed. Gang member Brian Rogers refuses to confess to the murders of Mike Beverly or Tracy Saunders. And with no evidence against him, detectives have no choice but to release him. We had to build our case, and that's what we did. They start by looking into Mike's phone records. The uh, last number that uh, he called came back to a uh, Gloria Adams who resided uh, steps away from the, uh, the location of the homicide. It was about uh, 8.30 that Mike had called the number on Ward Street. And it was only about uh, 10 minutes prior to his being uh, shot and being found uh, dead at the scene. Detectives immediately go to Gloria Adams' home in the Highland Gardens neighborhood. We knock on the door. Gloria Adams, she says, I know Mike. Mrs. Adams was visibly upset. I mean, she was shaking at a, at a point. She was upset about the, uh, the fact that uh, Mike had been shot. Gloria tells detectives that she had known Mike for years. Not only that, Mike had been a positive role model for her 18-year-old son, Maurice. Maurice hung around with the Boyle Street Boys, but more of a uh, wannabe than a actual member. Miss Adams was concerned uh, about her son and his welfare and his dealings with people in the neighborhood. Mike was uh, trying to do that as he had done for other people in the neighborhood. If they asked him, is there any way that you could uh, talk to my son because he's really going astray. Mike would try to talk to him to direct them in a better path. We learned this is the reason Mike is at that location of Highland Gardens. He was just stopping by a friend's house. 
While interviewing Ms. Adams, she uh, indicated that after he left, she heard the gunshots, and uh, she said she looked outside and she saw Mike laying next to the to, to his car. She just was very upset. Detectives finally understand why Mike was in Highland Gardens. Now, they hope to talk to her son, Maurice. While we were there, Maurice Day uh, came home. He indicated that at the time that uh, Mike Beverly was killed, he had already arrived at uh, his girlfriend Teresa Knight's house sometime around 9 o'clock. He was very upset. Maurice's girlfriend confirms he was with her. Just when it seems any leads are drying up. Jenkins. Detectives receive an anonymous tip okay. that they hope will lead them to the murder weapon. On uh, October 18th, uh, the two detectives assigned got information to check the uh, abandoned buildings over on Boyle Street that they may find some weapons uh, over there. So they started uh, checking the abandoned buildings. When they entered that house, they were uh, checking the cabinets. And uh, one of those detectives uh, opened the uh, um, oven uh, door. And they found a, uh, a gun wrapped in a uh, T-shirt. It happened to be a 44 caliber. It was uh, found to have uh, four spent shell casings within the revolver, which would match up to Michael Beverly being uh, shot four times. It was a huge find. This could be the weapon used to uh, kill Michael. The gun and casings are sent to the lab to determine if they match the bullets found in Mike's body at autopsy. When the ballistics came back, it uh, came back as it was the murder weapon of Mike Beverly. Investigators seem to be one step closer to identifying the shooter. They sent the t-shirt and the uh, weapon for DNA. If you can get a DNA match on somebody, it, there's no doubt about it, you were there. But when the results come back, it's another dead end. There is no DNA on the gun or T-shirt to connect the murder weapon to the shooter. It's actually hard to get some DNA. It's not like you see on uh, you know, CSI. You have to really have a, a good sample. Without being able to get uh, any kind of uh, forensic evidence, it's, it's very frustrating. On October 23rd, 2001, seven days after his murder, thousands gathered to mourn the passing of veteran police officer, Mike Beverly. Mike's funeral was on the west side of Chester at the first Pentecostal church, which at the time was the largest church in the city of Chester. It still wasn't big enough. There's police departments from Florida Maine, all over the country they came, and to pay their respects to one of their own. A uh, day at a funeral, that was another day to remember. His funeral was like a scene out of a movie or something. It was unbelievable. So many people came out, so many people. One of the hardest thing was to see him laying there. The second hardest thing was to see his family sitting there. We all just held each other. We cried so much that we couldn't cry anymore. That was a very, very um, difficult funeral to go through uh, for myself personally. And I'm saying to myself, well, I'll find that evidence. 
I will solve this case. Michael Beverly will not have died in vain, and we will not let his killer go. We will find his killer. No matter what, we will find him. By December 2001, two months have passed since Mike Beverly's murder, and Brian Rogers is their number one suspect. But they still need proof to tie him to Mike Beverly's murder. Brian Rogers, like any other criminal, never want to get caught. The whole purpose of committing a crime is hopefully to be successful in getting away with it. Ray Carr decides to take a big step to ramp up the investigation. I went into the U.S. Attorney's Office. I talked to the Assistant United States Attorney, and I said, we need to do something. When I was introduced to the investigation, it appeared to me that the state and local entities were still working diligently to solve these crimes. It's just they needed an extra boost. Here's the situation. Nobody's talking to us because they're afraid if they do, then they'll wind up like Tracy Saunders or Mike Beverly. So we have to create an environment where they will. Thanks a lot. We need to find out what they know. Some of the witnesses says, how is that going to ensure that nobody's going to know what I'm saying? And I said, because we're bringing in the whole neighborhood. You weren't going to be singled out for being the one that was brought into the police station. Everybody's being brought into the police station. There has never been a tactic where we shut down a whole neighborhood. It takes a great deal of resources from the DEA, the FBI, and the U.S. Attorney's Office. You had the Chester Police Department, Delaware County CID, Pennsylvania State Police. We go in, we block off the entrances and exits to Highland Gardens. Every single home was knocked on, and they were given a subpoena. For the next 18 months, once a week, we brought 30 to 40 people down to Philadelphia, and we interviewed every single one. We even subpoenaed the Boyle Street gang members. Some of them had no information at all. Some of them did. The dramatic and unprecedented efforts of the multi-agency task force pay off. A woman comes forward in the murder of Tracy Saunders, the case Mike had been so driven to solve. There was a witness that saw everything happen. She saw Brian Rogers go up to the car and fire two rounds at Tracy Saunders. And she yelled out, it was B, it was B. That is Brian Rogers' nickname on the street. And I placed that witness into protective custody. After an intense manhunt, Brian Rogers is arrested for the murder of Tracy Saunders. Realizing his best option is to make a plea deal, he agrees to talk. The person that was killed, Tracy Saunders, was a federal witness. It's a sentence of minimum of life. Uh, could be a death penalty case, all depending on how it's packaged. Brian Rogers confessed. I killed Tracy Saunders. I did it. I shot her in the head. I'm confessing what I did, and that, that doesn't happen very often. But Rogers insists he didn't kill Mike. Then he claims he knows who did. And he tells us that, yes, uh, he knows exactly what happened. And he has a name, one that the detectives have heard before, but never connected to Mike's murder. And he tells us Maurice Day did it. Maurice Day, the boy Mike Beverly had been trying to keep out of trouble. I thought to myself, I thought, wow. First thing was, why? What is this about? Mike was trying to help him. Maurice had told detectives he was at his girlfriend, Teresa's, the night of Mike's murder. Maurice Day said he had uh, arrived at uh, Teresa Knight's house sometime around 9 o'clock, and uh, Mike Beverly was killed somewhere after 9 o'clock. Teresa had initially corroborated Maurice's story. Teresa Knight, when she gave us her statement, indicated that Maurice had shown up uh, at her house. Police now tell her she'll be forced to testify 
if she doesn't tell the truth. Soon enough, she caves. According to Teresa Knight, Maurice, he didn't arrive there until after 9.30. And uh, when he did arrive, he was out of breath. Alibi's out the window. You're on my radar, pal. Detectives track Maurice down and bring him in for questioning. I said, I don't think you did it. I know you did it. I've been doing this for years. I talk to innocent people. I talk to guilty people. I know you did it. And he kept saying, well, I don't know. You don't have any evidence that I did it. I don't see how you could think I did it. We had no eyewitnesses and no physical evidence to come up with a, any type of an arrest in reference to Michael Beverly case. Detectives have no choice but to release Maurice Day. To Mike's fellow officers and family, it seems like the case is going nowhere. It just seemed like it was at a snail's pace. Time just started going longer, longer, and longer. And the anticipation of getting that person to justice seemed like it wasn't going to happen. That's how you, you solve most cases. You get lucky and you run into something that you really weren't looking for. It just happens to jump out in front of you. One year after Mike Beverly's murder in October 2002, detectives get that lucky break when a woman named Melanie Harris is arrested on a drug possession charge. And I was processing her. She said, I got some information about the Beverly case. I'll be honest, I take everything serious, but after almost a year of getting dead ends, I really didn't think we were going anywhere. Elijah Thompson tells me that she has some information. And she basically tells me that uh, she is an eyewitness to the uh, homicide of uh, uh, Michael Beverly. She was fearful for her life and for her safety and the safety of her family. That's why she didn't want to come forward. But uh, she said, I'm already in trouble. I've already been arrested. So I'm just going to tell you what I saw. Melanie claims she saw Mike leave Gloria Adams' home moments before he was shot. He was in the driveway, and he had his keys in his hand. She said that the shooter was a person she knew as East. She said a light-skinned, in her words, young boy, slim young boy. Some things that she was saying, only a person that was there would know. A woman named Melanie Harris claims she witnessed Mike Beverly's murder on October 16, 2001. Not only that, she knows who his killer was. She was referring to Maurice Day. And that's when Detective Nuttall said, we got what we need. And that's when he went and put together the warrant, the criminal complaint. We knew that all roads led back to Maurice Day. Even though you know that, and you know it in your heart, you still have to prove it. All units be advised, be on the lookout for Maurice Day. On October 12, 2002, they hunt down Maurice in Highland Gardens. Somebody saw him in the area, and uh, he took off running. We have eyes on the suspect. They ran him down and ended up uh, capturing him, placing him under arrest. Suspect is in custody. Maurice Day doesn't confess. but they learned the details of Mike Beverly's tragic murder from gang member Brian Rogers. Mike Beverly had become friends with Gloria Adams and was trying to keep Maury's day from hanging out over on the Boyle Street Boys uh, section. 
that individuals in Boyle Street and the crew were giving Day a hard time about the police officer always coming around looking for him. Yo, Maurice said Mike was his mom's friend, and she wanted him to stop hanging out with the Bull Street boys with us. They started calling him 5-0. Corporal Beverly, I mean, he was around a, a lot. Police kept showing up and arresting the boys, but not. Maurice, we started calling him 911 boy. He didn't like that. They said, every time you're here, it's like you, somebody called 911, the cops show up. He continued to escalate. Maurice said to me, I rocked him. One night in October, he says, I'll take care of it, I'll take care of it. He says, that's it, I'm gonna rock him. Maurice goes to an abandoned house over near Boyle Street, takes a 44 caliber weapon that belonged to one of the other Boyle Street members. He takes that gun out. He walks over and he waits outside behind a fence by his home. And Mike Beverly walks out. Maurice shot him in the face and then stood over him and shot him again in the torso. Mike's gun was in his holster. He didn't expect that whatsoever. He n knew this kid, and, and I don't think he ever thought ever that would happen from this kid. There was anger. It was personal. Mike Beverly never had a chance, never saw it coming. Maurice Day then goes to this girl's house and tells her, you're my alibi. And after he did it, he was very proud of what he did. Don't mess with Maurice Day anymore. Every time I think about this, I get angry did it. And he told me he did it. Mike Beverly would be pleased to know that on April 12, 2006, three members of the Boyle Street gang are put behind bars for the murder of young mother, Tracy Saunders. The guys that didn't make a good choice are doing life sentences. Brian Rogers received a sentence of 42 years. Mike's wife said to me at the end of this, she said, thank you. <laughs>